I would like to stress the point that no matter where you are in the room, please speak, project your voice, because it's difficult for people on other ends of the room to hear you. And I like hearing people when they debate in my room. So, uh, Chad, you're closest. All right. All right, so um, I'd like to address a uh, argument that because it's our body, it's our right to take our own lives. Well, um, recently in AP Gov, we had the pleasure of reading the second treatise of civil government by John Locke. Um, that might not sound exciting to most of you, but what I learned from it was um, John Locke had one really essential belief, that in order for a community to work, in order for a civilization to work, that the minute you enter a civilization, you are signing off some of your freedoms for the greater good of that community. Because when you enter a civilization, you are not entirely free. He, he said it was a state of nature that was originally what we come from. So if I go out and I kill someone, that's a state of nature. But because I sign the social contract and go into the community, if I go out and kill somebody, that's not right. Because I signed that social contract and I gave uh, some of my freedoms away. So with that said, people say, people say, oh, well, it's my right to decide whether I want to live or die. Well, no, you sign that way in a social contract when you join our civilization. And I think that's something that we should keep in mind. that we have a right to kill ourselves because that's also what this week is about. We shouldn't be taking away our lives. Instead we should be like celebrating like what makes our lives better. And like even though there is like terrible people that like they're not terrible but like their conditions are terrible, like we should try to make them like uplift them and like try to like build hope in them and like make a wish foundation and all that kind of stuff. Chad, excellent point of bringing up John Locke, because that's what exactly what I want to talk about. And another central belief of John Locke was that we all, you've probably, you probably even heard this, you all have the right to life, liberty, and property. So, yeah, thank you, John Locke. And thank you, Thomas Jefferson, for putting in the Declaration of Independence. But what that means is that that central belief can be used against euthanasia, and that we all have a right to, to our life. You have a right to live. You have a right to someone not go up to you with a gun and just blow your head off. That's what he meant by that. And we all, but that does not mean you have a right to control whether you live or die. Because your body is not your life technically. Your body is property. And what John Locke said about property was that it is your property when you put in labor to it. So if I clean this up, this back of this uh, golf cart, then it is part of my property. I invested time and labor into it, therefore making it my property. If I go to an empty lot and I develop it and make an uh, amusement park out of it, then that is my amusement park because I put in my labor. Well, you know who are the proprietors of your body? Your parents. Your parents put in the labor necessary to make you. Therefore, you do not own your body. You did not do anything to make yourself born. You did not do anything to make yourself a boy. You did not do anything to make yourself a girl. You invested nothing in your existence. Therefore, it is not your property. And infringing on another's property goes against this principle. If I were to go to uh, Disneyland and tip over a trash can and just vandalize it, then I'm infringing on someone else's property rights. Which, as Chad said, goes against the social contract because we abdicate some of our rights as soon as we enter into a civilized society with a government. So, just because you feel you have a right to your life does not mean you have a right to destroy your body by killing yourself, whether it be euthanasia or otherwise.
Um, before we move on to the next speaker, first I want to introduce um, one of our JSA alumni oh, and our chapter president. Yeah. 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 An excellent job, and he decided to come back for a visit. So, all right, guys, uh, this is probably one of the greatest parts of my high school experience was the JSA. Uh, why? Because, well, first of all, I love the stress about the family that you create in JSA. Um, throughout high school, you're going to go through ups and downs, roundabouts, and stuff. But JSA is kind of like the core where you can come and be open-minded, talk about how you feel, do anything you want to. And especially like dance your ass off at the at the events. But besides that, I mean, you have some chill people over here, and being able to learn what you do learn in JSA will take you far in life. I mean, I've met so many people just because I had so much information from other people around me. So keep the diversity up and stay chill in JSA. Awesome. All right. So uh, we're gonna move up to our speaker, uh, Sean. Thank you, Andrew. So, we're talking a lot about playing God. Should doctors be able to play God? And honestly, I don't feel it's playing God. It's not like a random person comes into an office, a doctor's office, for some procedure, and he's sitting there thinking, well, he wants to get a surgery on his nose. I'm going to throw in some euthanasia here without him knowing. Like, people coming in <laughs> know what they're signing up for. They're not playing God, they're being an aid, more of an angel if you ask me, to take someone out of their misery. And I don't think that, you know, doctors, they're prepared for that sort of thing. If you think they're not afraid to kill if they have to, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't be afraid to cut someone open and look at all that disgusting crap in there that they're doing surgery. I think they've got balls of steel as far as I'm concerned, and they could do this if they had to. In fact, I think this is a humane thing to do. Soldiers in World War II carried double the morphine they were supposed to. In case any soldier that was injured wanted to die, they would overdose that soldier on the field of combat and kill him if he didn't want to go on. Because World War II was a pretty scary time. You, I mean, you'd go out there, get blown up, shot up, nazi fied something, and they had to be prepared. If this man, who just stepped in a landmine and had his whole bottom half blown off and his organs were spilling on the beaches of Normandy, if he doesn't want to live, he doesn't have to. I will overdose him right here and put him out of his misery, send him back home and have a soldier's funeral. That's basically it. It's just about putting people out of their beliefs. Like Anthony said about, uh, it's my property, it's my life, and I can determine what I want to do. You may not think I did anything to, to be born, Anthony, but I did. When my dad got me into my mother, I beat a hundred million other people in a race to get to that end. And I believe in my heart that I deserve to determine what I do with this life that I fought so hard for. All right, Anthony? <laughs> Switch gears and move on to uh, our conspiracy theory topic.